good evening. good evening everyone so what we are doing tonight uh, is to have a very uh, brief uh, session because i just finished uh, my regular teaching running for the past three hours so i'm going to create opportunity if you have uh, maybe uh, some questions or you need some guidance I'm going to let it be a bit of like a Q&A session or interactive session. So if you want to speak, if there is something bothering you, or you some guidance uh, in terms of your preparation towards the entrance examination, you can bring it up and then we trash it out together. Yes, Moses. Yes, so if you want to speak, just unmute yourself. Barely uh, two to three weeks ago, so I'm sure now all of you have. Revise everything which needs to be revised. So I can only listen to you and direct him. You are ready? If you don't have questions, then I'm going to end the session tonight. Uh, somebody has said, when you are asked to write on enforcement of the constitution, what do you say? Uh, okay, then we have a question. When you are asked to write on the enforcement of the constitution, from the perspective of the Supreme Court, how best will that be approached? Okay. Uh, well, last last year there was a question on constitutional law, and that has to do with the 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 proper relationship between the you know, the High Court, the Supreme Court, when it comes to interpretation and enforcement of the constitution. Sorry, constitution. Uh, within that context, uh, someone has asked a question. If you are invited to discuss enforcement of constitution from pursuit of the Supreme Court, the person wants to find out how should one go about such a question. Okay, so uh, assuming you have a question like that, mm -hmm. I would like to presume it's an essay question from how you have presented it. What is required of you, first of all, is to get your points and arrange them in logical order. And you will not do a justice to this question. Uh, first and foremost, if you don't uh, you know, you start with the, uh, the supremacy of the constitution, we talk about the orig exclusive original jurisdiction exclusive original jurisdiction of the 19, oh, sorry, of the Supreme Court uh, of Ghana. And within uh, that, you also talk about, uh, of course, you are taking us uh, back to uh, maybe some aspects of the issues uh, which also came up, unless by this question, uh, you're, on, you're also interested in Letting us draw upon how the Supreme Court uh, goes about in exercising its uh, power of uh, enforcement, uh, which it has also said in various authorities that uh, enforcement and interpretation are not uh, mutually exclusive and they may go hand in hand. 
So first, the supremacy of the constitution. Uh, we know from the, uh, the constitution, uh, particularly uh, after uh, one uh, clause two, that uh, the, the constitution is the supreme law of Ghana. And that means that any law, any act, anything within the polity, within the Republic of Ghana must be uh, consistent, must be compatible with the letter and spirit of the constitution. And that has got a certain implication. If the constitution is the supreme, then it follows that uh, it must be the duty and province of someone to tell us when the, the constitution has been violated, when the constitution has been breached, or when one has exceeded parameters uh, permitted by the constitution. And that is why Article 2 uh, provides the enforcement mechanism that if anybody is making an allegation that any enactment or any action or omission uh, is not in conformity to the letter and spirit of the constitution, that person may bring a nation or that person is required to bring a nation to the Supreme Court for declaration uh, to that effect. And that is why if you go to the chapter on the judiciary, especially Article 130, the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Uh, it is made quite clear that uh, subject to chapter, I mean, subject to Article 33 of the Constitution, that is, Article 33 of the Constitution says that when it comes to enforcement of fundamental human rights and freedoms enshrined in Chapter 5 of the Constitution, uh, that has been reserved for a particular court, and that court is the High Court. So therefore, where you are seeking just enforcement of your human rights, and you are not requiring any interpretation of the Constitution necessarily, then you don't go to the Supreme Court, you go to the High Court. But where uh, we are talking about interpretation, we are talking about uh, enforcement of the constitution, or even where you even have like a, a human right, and that human right is not just uh, you seeking to enforce a human right, but that is very much uh, dependent upon the interpretation which one may give to uh, the constitution one way or the other, then it falls within the purview of the exclusive jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in respect the uh, interpretation and enforcement of the constitution. Yeah, so all these things will have to be canvas. And of course, when it comes to uh, constitutional interpretation, if you wanted to cite even uh, uh, 20 or 30 uh, authorities, there are a lot of them, a lot of uh, cases in which uh, Mata came to Supreme Court for uh, interpretation or for enforcement. You know, you can cite a lot, the Deferred December case, more recent uh, cases, Amidu, uh, J.H. Mensa, uh, Somali, you know, Bebel and all those things. We can cite you know, over 30 cases, because almost all the cases which goes to Supreme Court, uh, and apart from the ones which relates to appellate jurisdiction. That is where a matter has traveled through the appeal route after the Court of Appeal and then goes to the Supreme Court. All the other cases are essentially uh, interpretation enforcement of the Constitution one way or the other. Yeah, so I think that that is uh, what uh, we should remember. But, uh, you know, the case of, uh, you know, last year, you know, the Republic versus, uh, you know, my country, and then uh, let me give you uh, just a minute. Let me give you some, I don't know whether the, the person who has the, the question uh, has a dream that uh, there will be a 
<laughs> so, uh, for example, last uh, year, just trying to assess the uh, some discussion I've done around the last year. So, I think constitutional law uh, question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, at the last year, the question was that. Uh, with reference to the relevant constitutional provisions and the aid of case law, critically examining Supreme Court divergence on whether the High Court has the power to enforce the constitution. Yeah. So uh, the last year uh, question, the emphasis was on, uh, yes, the Supreme Court has the original jurisdiction to interpret the constitution and all that, but then, <laughs> Uh, there has also been uh, this impression that the High Court has also, if you like, uh, got uh, powers or jurisdiction in respect of the Constitution. Is it true or is it not true? Or how do these uh, you know, seemingly uh, align uh, jurisdiction actually uh, interplay? I mean, that was uh, part of the question. So. Uh, students were required to discuss aspects of jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and on one hand, and then the High Court on the other hand, in relation to enforcement of the Constitution. And essential to that was the need to also provide a, a brief elaboration on the concepts of you know, constitutional application and then uh, interpretation. So for example, it would have been a good idea if candidates, for example, uh, you know, started off discussing Article uh, 1, Clause 2, Article 2, uh, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution, uh, which we have already uh, cited. That is the enforcement uh, uh, clause. And also Article 33, Clause 1. If you go to Article 33, Clause 1, you know, we are told that subject to the exclusive original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court uh, regarding interpretation of the Constitution under Article 130, the High Court shall have exclusive jurisdiction you know, regarding enforcement of the Constitution of the, of the uh, fundamental human rights and freedoms enshrined in uh, Chapter 5. So you discuss that, and then you also, uh, of course, that goes with Article 140, Clause 2, and uh, you were also, you know, it would have been a good idea if you also discuss Article 41 and Article 41, Clause 1 of the Constitution. You know, if you look at Article 41, Clause 1, it talks about duty of citizens to uphold and defend uh, the law. If you look at the Constitution, there's a provision there to that effect that every uh, citizen has a duty to. Uh, actually uphold and defend uh, the law. If you look at the, uh, I think the 40, uh, it is something uh, which, I'm sorry, 41, duties of a citizen is something uh, which is there to uphold and defend this constitution and the law. So uh, that is the duty of everyone uh, in relation to Article 2. And that is why Article 2 says that if, you think that an enactment or any action or mission done by anyone is not consistent with the constitution, then you are enjoined to bring uh, a case to the Supreme Court for declaration to that effect to be made. Yeah, so you were supposed to uh, you know, look at, you know, this is a very, creative uh, you know, reasoning, look at Article 41, Clause 1, duty of citizen to uphold and defend the law. And then you read together with Article 2, and of course, Article 130, Clause 1 and Clause 2, on interpretation and enforcement of the Constitution. And as I said, there are a lot of cases uh, which you can cite. The famous Espat Yakuza case, Espat Yakuza, uh, Republic versus uh, Mike Kankan. I do say against Attorney General, National Media Commission against Attorney General, Abevo against Attorney General, 
Adofo against Attorney General Metonunu against Electoral Commission, Osei Boatin against National Media Commission in Apentin, Smile Abebel against Adamu Dramani, Asari and General Legal Council, Ko and Attorney General, Boku Asari against Attorney General, and so many. You can, if you know, we cannot exhaust, there are a lot of cases which actually uh, relates to enforcement and interpretation of the constitution. Yeah. Now, if you look at all these cases, uh, you have certain thread running through them. Uh, that is one, uh, interpretation, application, enforcement are distinct concepts. So interpretation relates to trying to ascertain the meaning, scope, and legal effect of constitutional provisions. And then if you talk about application, it refers to giving effect to constitutional provisions that are clear and unambiguous in meaning. So where there's no controversy regarding the meaning or the import of a constitutional provision, then you just have to apply it. And then enforcement relates to uh, compelling obedience to constitutional provision. That is ensuring that organs or entities or citizens actually adhere to the tenets of the constitution. So that is enforcement. But uh, jurisprudentially, or uh, you know, if you are talking in terms of legal theory, it is not easy to draw a fine line between application and enforcement. Yeah, so that uh, has to be appreciated. So we, we don't have to really worry our heads so much about the nicety of distinction between uh, some of these similar concepts. And we know that uh, Espartia Kosa is a, a celebrated uh, uh, decision on whether a matter raises any issues of interpretation or enforcement. And if you read uh, that case, it propounded the uh, four uh, stage tests or the four part tests, uh, if you remember, on whether uh, an issue is really that is provoking interpretation or uh, enforcement. But you notice that as part of uh, ACOSA has also gone through uh, refinement. And you look at the cases like the uh, you know, Metelunu, against the Electoral Commission, and then the call against the Attorney General. Uh, the Supreme Court have actually refined aspect of the test, which was propounded in the ACUSA, as to when will the court say that there is an interpretative issue or an issue of enforcement. And uh, again, uh, it will be useful to uh, try with respect to the interpretive or enforcement uh, jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and the enforcement jurisdiction of the High Court to you know, converse issues like, uh, for example, that the High Court has exclusive original uh, jurisdiction to enforce the fundamental Human Rights and Freedom in Chapter 5, as we have seen in Article 33, uh, Clause 1 of the Constitution. And again, that the Supreme Court does not have concurrent original jurisdiction with High Court to enforce Chapter 5 of the Constitution. It doesn't have concurrent original jurisdiction. Uh, the, the caveat, right, will, for example, be that where there is an issue like if we take the case of uh, you know, Ampofo, right? Uh, the Ampofo AJ, right? For example, against the Attorney General and all that, because what they call the, the, the pit latrine case, right? The pit latrine case, for example, there's an aspect about uh, personal dignity. So one who have argued that uh, that is a human right issue, no, but there was an issue of uh, interpretation embedded in that. So where uh, a human right issue 
actually has underlying constitutional interpretation, then uh, that will make it a good candidate for the Supreme Court to exercise its jurisdiction uh, over it. So let us keep that in mind. Or sometimes the matter is before even the High Court. And the High Court uh, takes the view that there is a constitutional uh, interpretation uh, you know, relevant to the matter before. The, the High Court will have to stay uh, the resistance, refer the interpretation or the interpretive question to the Supreme Court. And when the Supreme Court has determined the constitutional position, it will be remitted or referred back to the Supreme to the High Court for the High Court to apply the interpretation to resolve the factual issues before uh, the court as it were. So let us uh, keep that in mind. And I think if you are able to uh, canvas you know, points like this, you should be able to actually uh, you know, address the heart of the question and get reasonable uh, credit. Yes, so any other question? Uh, in a few minutes, this will be running out. We're using a basic account. Yes, any other question? Hello, sir. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, Jay. Good evening, Jay. Yes, I can hear you. I'm um, to the topic. I've been discussed. Sorry. All right, thank you. So then, I'm not, discussing, that will be I'm not discussing any particular topic uh, tonight. I just wanted to do a uh, direction with you. And somebody asked a question, uh, which made me do a bit of uh, talking. Uh, so we were just trying to address a question by Jacob, which was All that right, uh, so to my question about this on enforcement. Sorry. Yeah, my ahead. question about this on the enforcement, as we were discussing. Okay. The, the enforcement of this, the capacity that for the capacity of the plaintiff has been discussed in the Siba case, that whether when Article 2 says that a citizen of Ghana may apply to the Supreme Court for the enforcement jurisdiction, and as to the, and, and as to the citizen, whether it extends to a corporate body or a natural person, as it was enforced in the Siba case. No, and okay. then again, Yes. Yes, go ahead. All right, thank you. And then my second other question is, that is when the same question on this enforcement that you just finished and we were discussing, can we also apply under uh, um, um, Article 23 of the High Court, that is Article 23, that is, the second question. And the third one being that if the question is being given to us and they require a specific provisions in the act, um, sorry, in the constitution, and you're unable to provide all of them, will we be able to penalize, will we be penalized for not bringing all the provisions that they require on the question? Or if you are able to give some of them, you can get your full marks and go away, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so I will start from the, the bottom of the, the queries that you raised. And because uh, that question that you raised actually uh, runs through a lot of uh, other areas. Now, when you go to the exams and they ask you a question, and for example, the question requires you to discuss a constitutional matter and certain 
uh, provisions are required as part of the answer. But you don't remember, let's say, the number, right? You don't, for example, remember at 23, uh, you know, in relation to, let's say, the Awuni against the Wayek, you know, and so on and so forth. Then what do you have to do? But if you remember the the provision, remember like the, what is contained there, but you don't remember the, the, the number. Uh, so long as you remember the provision correctly, I think you should be fine. Even if you not get the full marks, you will not uh, be marked wrong. But where, but maybe the advice I give is that, you know, your examiners and markers, they are, marking under pressure. So when you are writing your answers, your answers should be written with reasonable you know, clarity. And if you're able to cite authorities needed and all that, you let them stand out and all that so that what you want to say will be clear. And don't let your examiners or markers struggle too much to understand the point you want to make. Uh, don't forget that uh, examiners are still human beings. And human beings, we have that psychological dimension. If you take a script and the script is uh, reader friendly, you know, the layout is neat. Uh, the points are, you know, written with clear language, logical structure and all that. You are psychologically, you are favorably disposed to that paper, except where the paper has actually committed some horrible uh, errors. Otherwise, uh, you, are, you are quite disposed to it. And when you are, you know, allocating the mass according to the marking scheme, Unconsciously, uh, such a script would elicit a good response from you without even you being aware, but because of you know the clarity and all that. So if you don't remember the, the, the number, article number, that is not the end of you. Uh, just say that according to the 1992 constitution, but make sure that you are not making up, right? You are not making up what you are saying. What you are saying is actually borne out by the constitution. But if you say that according to the constitution and what you have said, despite the fact that you don't remember the number, there is no way that the constitution is saying that. In that case, uh, you are misleading everyone and you'll be punished for that. You don't have to mislead your examiners when it comes to the position of the law. So that is all that I will say. Yes, that if you cannot pinpoint the provision, uh, it's not so fatal. So far as you have actually learned and you know the principle, right? Yeah. I'm told that my meeting will be ending in 10 minutes because I'm using just a basic account. I'm not using my work run. Uh, I use the work run for main class at tech and it was still uh, converting. So we needed to start with this. So don't worry when it ends, we have a bit more time tomorrow. Yeah, so coming back to your question as to whether it's only natural persons who can uh, bring up an action uh, with respect to uh, enforcement of the constitution. Well, it's not uh, that certain that it's only natural person because uh, artificial persons, even when it comes to enforcement of the uh, fundamental human rights, for example, when it comes to chapter 12, sorry, article 12 of the constitution on the chapter five, just want to draw your attention to something. You know, if you uh, look at you know, article 12, it talks about um, uh, legal persons, right? So say that by all natural and legal persons. So the argument 
uh, which one school of thought makes is that where the constitutional framers wanted to give capacity to natural and non-natural persons, it was so stated. And for that matter, where the constitution simply says a person, then the import is that is a natural person, which is what uh, contemplated. So like, for example, if you look at the two, is it like a, a person, right? But if you go to Article 12, uh, as I indicated, Article 12, one, Article 12, one, let me quote, the fundamental human rights and freedoms enshrined in this chapter shall be respected and upheld by executive legislature and judiciary and all other organs of government its agencies and where applicable to them by all natural and legal persons in Ghana and shall be enforceable by the courts as provided for in this constitution. So the point is that where the premise of the constitution contemplates uh, natural person and legal persons, they are clear, they, they point us to that. And for that matter, uh, where Article 2 says like the person, uh, a reasonable and respected body who say that that refers like a, a natural person and not artificial person. However, if you uh, put the human rights in the context of, let's say, uh, international human rights law, African human rights law, European and all that, when it comes to enforcement of human rights, artificial persons you know, are given uh, locus or they're given capacity. Uh, especially so where they may need to take up uh, cases uh, on behalf of uh, other uh, uh, persons. Now, let me give you another example. If you take like the case of Awuni against Waye, for example, there's an NGO called the LRC, Professor Tukubasa NGO at the time, Legal Resource Center, which was essentially behind uh, that case. Nevertheless, uh, we made the students of Xavier in the seminary who have been, I mean, the, that secondary school who have been banned by the Wayek without going through the process to be like the rare uh, parties. Yeah, so therefore, the person there uh, could be understood as natural persons. And as I've indicated, uh, where the constitution want us to uh, make use of both natural and juristic persons, so legal or artificial person, the constitution is quite clear. Yes. Uh, what else? In about two or three minutes, the, the 40 minutes will have come and then the machine will automatically go off. Okay. Uh, okay, so just before uh, it goes uh, off, I will Hello, like... Doc. Yes. Please. Please, we have some questions in the chat box. Uh, is it possible to, pre to predict any likely question? I don't predict questions. Sorry. <laughs> What about Sir John's will? <laughs> I don't predict questions. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sir John's will. Uh, yes. Which aspect is it? The do do you know something, please. Before the, the this thing will go off, I have said this and I'm saying it again. Uh, for me, the advice I'll give you is that avoid targeting just you know, one or two trending issues. And you, you let all your energies follow that. Now, if you go and there are no questions on those trending issues, what will you do? Will you accept to fill the paper? 
So I've told you in other sessions, I think my last session in the first few minutes, I talk about that. If you play it back, you hear it, that take the same subjects and on your own, uh, attempt to list all the topics under each subject on your own without opening any book. And under each topic, try and on your own without opening any books or going online, try and state the summary of the principles under each topic together with authorities that you remember. Do that for all the topics under that subject. When you, you are done, you go on to another subject and do the same thing for all the same subjects. If you do that, you know where you need to go and do a little bit more work, or if you need even somebody to help you to understand. That is a better way of preparing for this examination. So don't let us be physiated on just one or two uh, trending uh, issues. Yes, we have to be aware of what is going on, but that alone is not uh, a good approach in trying to pass examination like this. So the best approach is to make sure that uh, you do what I have told you, the same subjects, uh, do that auditing and know where you need more assistance. And then uh, you are helped to understand that is better. If I cite questions at all, I cite questions just to guide our revision. I don't cite any question because I think the question will come now. Because if I do that, I'll be deceiving you because I don't know the questions. I only have to help you to revise all the subjects and the topics, that is all. And finally, to practice how to answer questions. Your examiners have been complaining that the past three no years, four years, that students don't know how to answer questions. Some students, they've learned all right, but they don't know how to answer questions. So as we learn, try your hands on how to answer questions, how to answer essay questions, problem-based questions. So once you sharpen that skills and you, you have like the knowledge, I think that uh, you should be fine. Okay? Okay, bye-bye. All right. Okay, good morning.